All right, welcome into Surviving Paradise, the podcast that takes a sometimes serious, oftentimes humorous look at the claim by Jehovah's Witnesses that they are living in a modern day spiritual paradise. I'm your host, Stacey Bauman, former elder, ministerial servant, and as I say every week, more importantly, a kid raised in Jehovah's Witnesses in the 70s and 80s. And as I always do, if you're new here, welcome. We are really excited that you would take the time to listen to this little podcast. But I do want to say there's lots of sarcasm, lots of humor. Sometimes some swear words slip out. Never meant to offend anyone. Just injecting my own personality into this little podcast we do every week. And as is often the case when you're tackling a subject like Jehovah's Witnesses and you are a former Jehovah's Witnesses, emotions have a way of showing up oftentimes unannounced so again thank you welcome in everyone i will say really appreciate the feedback over the last few weeks both privately and publicly on all the social media sites podcast hosts and youtube last week's episode was a funny one uh i'll tell you the the episode we just did on universal sovereignty Gave us all a peek or maybe a reminder for some of us into Jehovah's judgment, or is it more appropriate to say unbelievably bad judgment? (laughs) Yet another week, if you're keeping score at home, has gone by where Jehovah is allowing a bully to torture his kids here on earth just to be sure that his name looks good. (laughs) As he spends time with the eight guys in New York, just a reminder that he apparently gave Satan control over weather patterns so he could blow down houses on Job's kids. He gave Satan access to his house in heaven until 1914. And the suffering continues as we navigate our way through life's challenges while he and Satan watch on and give each other big noogies. (laughs) I'm in a mood. I'm in a mood tonight. (laughs) So again, I appreciate it last night or last week, excuse me, that episode was an interesting one. But I listen, in in all seriousness, I think I'm going to actually get a little serious this week. At least I sense it each week as I travel and move through life. And I'm doing a lot of that right now, which is limiting some of the things we can do uh, here on the podcast, as I've stated For many weeks now, I want to bring on some interviews and have a little bit more fun looking at the cultural aspects of growing up at Jehovah's Witnesses. But in the interim, subjects are popping up all over the radar, much of it feedback from the fantastic people that listen to this little podcast. And I find myself thinking about subjects that may help people think or at least start to think. And as I'm very open about, I like to have a few laughs. I like to be entertained. Otherwise, I will lose my mind doing this. I often need to remind myself when talking about stuff like this, that I personally have been free of that soul crushing cult for 13 years now. And time has a way of healing you, giving you perspective, hindsight. You just change the way you may look at things, at least some things. But by extension, I also have found a weakness, at least in me, that oftentimes I can forget how painful and grueling it is to wrestle with all the emotions and the loss when you're at ground zero, whether you're still a Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's Witness, excuse me, that's continuing to associate, though you're mentally out, or you're someone who is full on just completely faking it so that you can keep your family fading, whatever the case may be, sometimes I need that reminder too. And I will be very transparent in saying I've been receiving many personal notes, direct messages via the social media sites from really wonderful people. And I want to thank you all. Sorry, I can't respond to all of them. If I have missed you or missed one of your comments, please, please forgive me. I'm horrible at it. And I often find them in hindsight when I have a few minutes to go back and look. But I'll get notes from people, and I've really had some remarkable ones regarding the pain they still deal with from this religion, the misery they're still navigating, they're trying to figure their way out of, 
or I've really been impressed with the people that are in relationships, whether it's marriage or dating or whatever the case may be with someone who is a former Jehovah's Witness and they simply really struggle to relate to some of the things that they're trying to unwind out of their mind and heart, but they love their significant other and they want to understand. Really impressed with those messages. I want to thank people that have sent those, really all of them. So with that said, I wanted to spend this episode this week validating how difficult being a Jehovah's Witness really is. And not just being a Jehovah's Witness or associating with them, but also the fear, the fear of leaving and the inevitable guilt they've baked into our brains with a steady stream of endless meetings, billions of pages of publications. They moved into the modern era in the last 10 years with a television studio, videos, all kinds of emotion-inducing music, and a whole bunch more. I will tell you that I have the perspective as a kid who was raised a Jehovah's Witness from a very young age. I was about four when my mom got baptized in Southern California. And without playing favorites or being biased, I have to state that I think those that were born into Jehovah's Witnesses or were raised as one have the most difficult time when they begin to realize something's wrong. Something in them triggers and it is incredibly emotional and painful and frankly, scary as hell, scary as hell that suddenly you realize everything you've built your life on may be a pile of BS. And that is not to discount those that came into the religion in other ways or as an older person. That has its own very special dynamic as a thinking person, almost always in pain or unhappy, searching for meaning. And then you get sucked into this cult. That has a a separate dynamic, in, at least in my personal mind. But I think those that were born in and raised in it have a really, really difficult time when suddenly out of nowhere, they're facing something they just never thought they would even give consideration to. That this whole thing is just an absolute bunch of BS. And that's a very simple and a simplistic way of looking at it. So as mentioned this week, I want to validate that. I want to talk about the two tools that they use to keep millions uh, ensnared, trapped. And to start off, to be candid, this podcast is called Surviving Paradise. <laughs> yes, that's a misnomer. And it's a misnomer for a reason. And I often laugh and I'm going to continue to laugh because that's me. And sometimes I have a cry now and then. The, this whole thing is rooted in how being a Jehovah's Witness is a living hell. It's a living hell. Sure, there's good things. I'm not going to discount that there's some nice people. There's some fun experiences. You may even be able to learn a thing or two. But it's a hell, and it molds a young mind. It molds any mind to think and see their entire life, the world, everything differently. And it's all under the direction of eight guys in upstate New York, as we have stated on this show a million times. I used to be asked a lot, and still from time to time I get this question, to describe the experience. What's the feeling? Somebody who may be a little deeper thinker and wants to unpack the whole thing. They want to understand how I saw the world when I was a Jehovah's Witness. And I... I did struggle with that for a long time, and I'm not sure if my explanation, because I had to make it simple for myself, will resonate with anyone listening, but I'll share it. So when I get asked that a lot, what the emotion was of being a Jehovah's Witness, and then, of course, the emotion of leaving, I've often explained it this way, and I, I'd love to know if anybody can relate to what I mean by this comment. I used to say this. The sky just isn't as blue. The sky just isn't as blue as it is for other people. I know that sounds weird. I know that sounds simple. <laughs> I totally get it. But somewhere on my journey, I came up with that. That's how I define the overall impact to me as a person in simple terms. Jehovah's Witnesses 
live under these two tools that we're about to jump into. These two things that are forced on them, oftentimes from a very young age, as you will see. And it truly shapes everything. And for me, being able to just describe that even colors, even colors, don't look the same to us as they might to someone else is just the easiest way for me to describe it. The sky just isn't as blue. Has it ever been as blue for me? Starting to be, even 10, 13 years out. But that was the simple way in which I tried to describe people the impact that this religion had on my life. So those that have never been a Jehovah's Witness or have one in their life that they are in love with or they care about, Often they oft, those folks often struggle to understand how any of us chose to live in a world that regularly does what we're about to talk about. How did you guys get trapped there? And more importantly, how did you stay there? What is it that makes you stay? We're not making any money at this. We're getting poorer. We're not getting more educated. No. We're not becoming more famous. No. The answer is unfortunately painfully simple. And it's an answer that's been used by powerful people to control whether it's one person or the masses since the dawn of time. So what is it that makes life with Jehovah's Witnesses a, a living hell? How can we understand why it is that people get trapped as a Jehovah's Witness and they stay even years after leaving, it really comes down to two things. Those two things are fear and guilt. Fear and guilt. So I want to start there. I want to start with fear. And what's driving this for me is, again, a lot of really amazing personal messages over the last few weeks, oftentimes from people who are in a relationship with an ex-Jehovah's Witness or don't completely understand it. I want to help those folks understand as well as any witness listening, anybody who's on the fence, just how impactful fear will start there is on your life and what it's doing to you. And, and I want to say, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist, but I play one on the audio podcast. <laughs> Again, like everything, this is my perspective, my experience, my conclusions. But I think I'm pretty spot on with this one. Please tell me if you agree or disagree. I'm way up for that. But I want to start there with fear. Fear is a harsh reality of the human experience. It can be used in a healthy way. I'm thinking of examples like when we teach a young child, don't touch the hot stove for fear of being burned. Don't run in the street for fear of cars. There are healthy reasons that fear exists. And I'm not going to go too deep on that. It's, it's an inevitable part of the human experience. However, when it comes to controlling people, when it comes to controlling the masses, fear is an evil weapon. And the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses has mastered the art of fear. They use it to control what they claim is an estimated 8 million people. You talk about a power trip. Imagine what those guys talk about. <laughs> and they use this fear to control them. And it's more than that because often, even after people leave Jehovah's Witnesses, guess what follows them out the door? Fear. If you're listening to this and you're on the fence I am guessing you know exactly what I'm speaking of. Fear. What is it that's keeping me from running from something so incredibly wrong, so incredibly depressing? It's fear. So oftentimes, even after a witness leaves, they still feel fear. Fear that Jehovah hates them now for doubting. Fear that Jehovah hates them now for leaving. Fear of Armageddon. They're going to be burnt to a crisp. Fear of missing out on paradise and, you know, their own pair of khakis and a fruit bowl. <laughs> fear of Satan, fear of the demons, on and on and on. I, in the 70s and 80s, they went into everything 
interpersonal relationships, you should be afraid of getting venereal disease. You should be afraid of getting high. You should be afraid of music. You should be afraid of dancing. You should be afraid of everything. And that fear doesn't necessarily disappear just because you leave the kingdom hall. I am here to tell you it can last for years, decades. I know of people that I would consider elderly that still admit to me they feel fear. What if I'm wrong? What if those eight guys in upstate New York are right, even though they've been wrong on every single solitary thing they've ever printed? What, what if I'm wrong? I would like to spend this episode talking about every single fear tactic or subject or source of fear, but I'm not going to. I'm going to take one. I'm going to take one and give you an example. So if you are a witness or you are someone who loves one or loves one who's out and experiencing fear, take note of this. Let's take one fear tactic that is incredibly powerful and incredibly pressing and flat out evil that they do to Jehovah's Witnesses. Here it is. You can really never leave. You can never really leave. Nothing says free will. Like, if you leave, which you have the right to do, we're going to chase you out the door. And when I mean we, it could be people, it could be belief systems, but it most certainly includes fear. I, right now, I'm just sitting here thinking to myself right now, I've got that the lyric in my head, you can check out, but you can never leave. And, uh, you know, Don Henley, Hotel California, the Eagles. <laughs> you can check out, but you can never leave. You were taught early on as a Jehovah's Witness that there's nothing outside the organization. And I often related that to being a young kid with horror movies, which were, of course, demonized, see past episode. And that actual rush of emotion you get if you're actually sitting and watching a horror movie where you know the monster or demon is behind the door and the person's about to open the door. Don't open the door. Don't open the door. Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that same fear, that, that same anticipation that everything is going to go wrong. Everything and everyone outside the organization is scary. They're evil. They're deadly. However, there are very few fears, at least in my opinion, that have the power to destroy your life than losing your entire belief system. And frankly, for many Jehovah's Witnesses, the thought of leaving behind everything they've ever known is the exact very dynamic that keeps them associating with the society as we said a lot in the 80s with the organization. People are people. We're all made of the same stuff. And some of us can't bear the thought of doing anything different, of change, of accepting anything less than the colorful pictures we've been force-fed and inundated with over the years in Watchtower publications. They are literally trapped by the mere thought of change and it is force-fed to Jehovah's Witnesses from the word go. And that includes children, very young, impressionable minds, week after week. And if you've listened to other episodes, you know I have a soft spot for that very demographic, the little guys and girls. This stuff is force-fed to a Jehovah's Witness. I know you are probably asking, so here it comes. The Watchtower, January 15th, 1983, quote, If we get to thinking that we know better than the organization, we should ask ourselves, where did we learn the Bible truth in the first place? Would we know the way of the truth if it had not been for the guidance from the organization? Really, can we get along without the direction of God's organization? No, we cannot, end quote. <laughs> now, you may look at that and say, eh, okay, that sounds like, that seems passive. Really unpack what was just done there. 
in the Watchtower of January 15th, 1983. You could summarize the entire thing by, you need us. You need us. The final, par- the final sentence, rather, is really, can we get along without the direction of God's organization? No, we cannot. <laughs> it's incredible. It's an absolute mind F. I'll, I'll stop from saying the word. You know what I'm referring to. <laughs> From very early on in the process of becoming a Jehovah's Witness, Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that the organization is the only place that God's true servants dwell, that leaving the organization places you squarely in the lost or evil category. Not only that, but your life is about to become a living hell without us. You can't function without us. We're the ones who taught you the truth. Whole nother conversation. You need, as that said, that reference, January 15th, 83 Watchtower, you need our guidance to survive in a scary, wicked world. Now, as an adult, it's bad enough getting that messaging. But imagine a child, or for those of us that were raised as Jehovah's Witnesses, our entire thought process, the way we think, the way we see the world, is based on the fear of everything outside this organization. We can't leave it. We can't function without it. You're living under an umbrella of fear. And it starts early. And what's incredible, as we often do on this little podcast, we point out ways that the governing body, the eight guys in upstate New York, who has changed faces over the years uh, and going back several decades, even before they were called the governing body, Despite that, they often cherry pick or find a way to misapply scriptures and they don't do it in a way that's going to build you up as a person or give you self-confidence or make you feel safe. That never happens. They do it as a warning to start the trickle of fear. I would like to show you an example and it is one that is so unnerving, but to any Jehovah's Witness sitting there glazed over in the kingdom hall, who's exhausted from a day of work or school or life in general, they will completely miss this. They will completely accept it and just go about their night, not realizing that they are absolutely being brainwashed. How can I say this so boldly? Because I was brainwashed. (laughs) And this is one of those scriptures and things that they did or do or misapply would be the more appropriate term. That is absolutely my boggling. I point you to John chapter 6, verses 66 through 69 of the New World Translation, the highly doctored Bible of Jehovah's Witnesses. Nonetheless, in what is an unbelievable (laughs) discovery, here they are doctoring the Bible. Here they are changing words, Greek words. They somehow missed this one. But maybe that's by design because they've been able to pull it over on Jehovah's Witnesses for years. Let's jump in. John chapter 6, verses 66 through 69, where they find their first ingredient that they add to the, the fear recipe, so to speak. It says, quote, Owning to this, many of his disciples went off to the things behind and would no longer walk with him. Speaking here of Jesus. Therefore, Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, whom shall we go away to? You have sayings of everlasting life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. End quote. Now, you may have seen my emphasis there. Again, thank you, Theocratic School. (laughs) Now defunct and gone. So strange. But note that while Peter was referring to Jesus Christ himself, when he said to whom, to you, and it is you we have believed, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and the governing body apply those verses to the organization, causing any thought of change or leaving to cause immediate confusion, discomfort, cognitive dissonance, and most importantly, fear in a Jehovah's Witness. 
It doesn't say to where will you go, which might I add, if you look at their literature, they'll literally say where instead of whom. They will literally say to where instead of to you. This was a very personal conversation out of the Bible between Jesus and his apostles. Do you want to lead me to? And Peter says, who else would we go to? Who else has these sayings? We believe you. He didn't say we believe the publishing company in upstate New York building a massive publishing empire. Never said that. So the governing body begin this trail of fear, and they usually start here with the organization. Where else are you going to go? You need us. You need us eight guys. You need all our literature. You need this organization. And if you don't believe that, or you're someone listening in right now who really questions that, allow me, as I often state, and I'm going to state it every episode, you don't need apostates or websites. Just read your own stuff. May I point you to the Watchtower, November 15th, 1992, page 21. Quote, we will be impelled to serve Jehovah loyally with his organization if we remember that there is nowhere else to go for life eternal. When Jesus' statements caused many disciples to go off to the things behind, he asked his dis apostles, excuse me, you do not want to go also, do you? Peter replied, Lord, whom shall we go away to? You have sayings of everlasting life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. An example of what I just stated. We often wonder how a Jehovah's Witness gets trapped. Why do they stay? Aside from family and disfellowshipping and shunning, which we covered here and will likely do again, I present to you the reason. Fear. From the outset, a Jehovah's Witness is taught that this organization, these eight guys in upstate New York, replace Jesus. <laughs> they replace him. I just read it to anyone listening right from the Watchtower magazine, November 15th, 1992. You notice that they say in the paragraph, quoting the verse, the verse says, to whom shall we go, said Peter. The next sentence in the paragraph says, there is nowhere else to go for life eternal. This is the subliminal, fearful messaging that Jehovah's Witnesses face every week. The guilt trip begins. It begins. Peter never said, to where else will we go? There wasn't anywhere else to go. <laughs> he said, to whom? But Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's often precious, impressionable minds, kids are taught, oh my God, where else will you go? Where? If you leave this place, you are going to live a life that is one giant nightmare. And if you think that I'm exaggerating, please be assured I'm not. Any witness or those that have left will tell you that this is a very real fear. It's very real, and they have really perfected it in modern times. They've taken it a step further than anything I was exposed to as a kid or even as a servant and elder. Now they have a television studio. They, have, they create videos set to goosebumpy, emotional music. They've got imagery of Jehovah's Witnesses holed up in bunkers, while guys in flak jackets with machine guns barge through the door. They've got pictures of people hiding, not people, witnesses hiding in attics, rationing their food and studying the Bible together while they listen to mass destruction and fireballs burying their neighbors outside the door. They literally, in, in a recent video, I think it was the 2016 district convention, they, they show the people in the bunker talking about a brother who decided not to join them. Again, fear. He's living outside the organization, outside this room, outside the bunker. And all the sadness on their faces. And a couple of 
quips and anecdotes as to, oh, poor Billy, or whatever his name was. They go so far as to show secret door knocks for the people who want to get into the bunker. I mean, they've really upped their game, folks. They've upped their game since I was a kid. Now it's miniature movies of this nonsense. And all of that is based and rooted in fear. None of it's encouraging. It's meant to move anyone watching it, especially children, but also grown adults seeking and looking for answers to problems in life to be completely dependent on this organization. That's it. And so even those who are Jehovah's Witnesses now or those who decide to leave Jehovah's Witnesses, that fear doesn't just wash off you with a shower or two. It lives in you. They do enough over a great deal of time to create a lasting fear in you that you're dependent on them, that you need them, and that life outside of them is deadly, dangerous, unhappy, depressing. I mean, I, I mentioned it earlier, but in the 70s and 80s, they would just go on and on about, you know, you you leave the safe organization that we have created and you're going to die of gonorrhea and you're going to start taking drugs and overdose and the people in your life are going to completely hate you they don't love you like we do on and on and on this stuff went this messaging but if you think it stops there if if the doubt and the fear that's crept in and pounded into their minds weekly isn't enough it just keeps getting better. <laughs> I present to you the Watchtower of 1988, March 15th, pages 18 and 19. This one <laughs> is just unreal. Quote, furthermore, suppose a person was to separate himself from Jehovah's people. Here we go again. Where could he go? Not to whom. Where could he go? Is he not faced with the same issue that confronted Jesus' apostles when he asked them that they also wanted to leave him? The apostle Peter rightly replied, Lord, whom shall we go away to? You have sayings of everlasting life. There is nowhere else to go but to Babylon the Great, the world empire of false religion, or in the clutches of Satan's political wild beast. Largely Disloyal ones who have left Jehovah's visible organization have made common cause with those in God dishonoring Babylon the Great. End quote. So it's not enough to just leave for those who may be thinking about it or those who are, love someone who's left and is dealing with this, these pains, these fears, these worries. They go on to not insinuate, but blatantly tell anyone who thinks about leaving Jehovah's organization that they are now part of false religion. Uh, absurd, con considering most people that leave end up being non-religious, atheistic, or agnostic. <laughs> or they're part of Satan's political wild beast. They instantly become overly political or politicized. Never does it dawn on them that people can leave, uh, just disappear into the countryside, grow their own plants, and live a wonderful life. <laughs> nope. If you leave us, you should be afraid because you have switched teams, people. You've switched teams. You are now on Team Satan by leaving an organization that, might I add, has been 100% wrong on every prophetic date that they pointed to, not 99%, not 80%, 100% wrong, that you were on Team Satan because you left an organization that has a database of pedophiles that they will not turn over to authorities, pedophiles that still are hanging out in kingdom halls, that you're on Team Satan because you decided to take blood and save your life because of modern medicine. <laughs> I could go on and on. I, I, I could get into absolutely ridiculous things 
Like you're on team Satan because you've suddenly decided to stop shaving your beard or because you decided that you love someone of the same sex and have a wonderful, deeply loving relationship or you get the point. But they do this and they do it in absolutely evil fashion to the point where not only are you now on team Satan, as I just read to you, but they will convince everyone who loves and knows you that you are on team Satan and they are no longer to speak to you. Even if you are a child, a sibling, a parent, that kind of misapplication of scripture is designed to keep you from change, from leaving to make you fearful to make you fearful of making any decisions to put it all in the past and move on. The implication is clear. You're on your own, which if they've conditioned you well, and believe me, they do creates instant doubt for any decisions or actions you take moving forward. In other words, fear, fear of anything outside the organization's walls, that you're going to be lonely in danger and ultimately dead. There's a fireball with your name on it at Armageddon. So for those who are on the fence wondering, why am I having this rush of emotion? For those that have been out for years wondering why this emotion continues to live in you. For those who love someone who's an ex-Jehovah's Witness, who's struggling with these emotions, just know you can never really leave this fear that they've conditioned you with follows many people out the door and it camps on the end of your bed <laughs> and it stays there oftentimes for many years. Tragically, I know of people that have never been able to shake it. They've never been able to shake it. So it's a very real thing. And when I'm often asked, how did Jehovah's witnesses get sucked into this? Why do they stay? There are probably a handful of reasons, but fear is oftentimes at the heart of all of it. I, as I was putting my thoughts together for this, I, I mean, let me ask you this. Who can forget, for those that are listening, in, one of their favorite illustrations? A man, have they gotten some mileage out of this thing? First Peter 5.8, that Satan the devil is a roaring lion on the loose, seeking to eat us all, to devour someone. And they put it in talks, they put it in illustrations, they've got unbelievable paintings of it on the pages of the Watchtower. It, it always made me think, again, uh, thanks for the warning, Jehovah, but, um, well, you're the one letting him roam. <laughs> See last week's episode on universal sovereignty. <laughs> I mean, even we puny humans know to put our dogs on a leash. <laughs> Not Jehovah. He made sure that we knew that it's in the Bible, that Satan's a lion and he's hungry and he's looking to devour us all. I'm not going to do anything about it. At least I get. Stay tuned. But they will ram that down your throat, complete with lots of colorful imagery your entire time as a Jehovah's Witness. And that, of course, is part of the fear that follows you out the door. You're easy prey now. Easy pickings. So again, if you're struggling with the emotions or to understand yourself or someone you love that's been a Jehovah's Witness, give this particular type of fear. I could have chosen a million different fears with Jehovah's Witnesses, but I think this one deserves a lot of thought. You can never really leave. Even if you leave, the fear follows you out the door and can take years to get rid of. And let me just say, it takes incredible courage to walk out of something that has literally shaped you. It's shaped your thinking, your emotions, everyone you know, everything you know, all your memories, everything. It has shaped you. It is scary as hell to walk away from everything you've known. I've mentioned it on this show before. The movie The Truman Show with Drew Carey. Incredible movie, had far more impact on me than probably 
and, and probably lots of other witnesses and others that have left religions and cults than just your common moviegoer. It just had a different impact. It was an excellent, excellent look at how fear keeps people trapped. The governing body has no shame in pushing this agenda of fear. They do it to children. And as anyone knows who knows me, that's the part that got me starting to hit record on this podcast. It, now, in my generation, it was the youth book. If you masturbated, you should be fearful of being gay soon, as if being gay was wrong, and it is not. Uh, but it's absolutely absurd to think that that leads to that. There were stage dramas showing people being killed and slaughtered. I remember one of my favorites, Jezebel, getting tossed out a window so the dogs could eat her. There's talks filled with fear-mongering. I've already mentioned a few of those. Everything from music to dancing to grooming to the way you dress, the way you think, having doubts, oh my God, thought control. They would teach us over and over again, and I'd love to hear some examples, <laughs> that if you left the organization, you were doomed to a life of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, never realizing that that sounded pretty damn good to this kid. <laughs> Minus the drugs, could care less. Uh, but who doesn't like sex and rock and roll? <laughs> but they would pound that down our throats. And I mean, again, I was in it from four. I went through the teenage years with it. I've been pretty open about my mistakes and will continue to be. I, I was, but it's interesting in my case, I was never very fearful as a Jehovah's Witness to be really transparent here. I always dealt more with guilt, which we're going to get into in a minute. But, but I was always, I guess, if fearful of anything, I was afraid of losing Jehovah's love. And I think for me personally, hoping there's might be more listeners, love to learn everybody's experiences. I, I was a fatherless boy. So there's no question that I built the archetype. I built the imagery. I built the bond. I, I don't know how you do that subject for another day with Jehovah as my quote unquote father, because I didn't have one. That was probably my greatest fear. And might I add that it plays under this theme, that if I walked away from all this nonsense that I was questioning, that I would lose out on that. I would lose Jehovah. I would lose the love of my father, which for me personally, as strange as it sounds, really helps me relate to people who are disfellowshipped, shunned, and have lost their families to this cult. And boy, does it get me upset. I'm going to just stay above board here, but boy, does it get me upset. But, but they're doing this to children. And if you're just a, just a casual listener to this, that should really concern everyone. More, it should concern you at a level that I can't even put words to. And it's all rooted in a child being afraid to be outside this organization. That's the fear we're focused on today. I'll give you an example. Have you seen, and I'm not encouraging it because Boy, I'll tell you what, you want to see me lose my cool, these do it. But have you seen these Caleb and Sophia cartoons? They've literally ripped off the Pixar, Disney look and feel. And I got to give them credit at their depth of evil. They know exactly what they're doing. They know that appeals to kids. They've ripped off this Disney-like cartoon, popped in a couple kids, Caleb, and his older sister, Sophia. And if you haven't seen these, I'll be very straight. And I've, I've been straight about this. It was one of the reasons I started hitting record on this podcast, those. And we need an entire episode to discuss how heinous these are. But in a nutshell, these cartoons are laced with the messages of fear and guilt. Yes, I've seen a few of them and they are unbelievable. They're also grossly unrealistic. Never mind that Caleb and Sophia, the cartoon characters, have incredible recall of Bible scriptures for their age. A better recall than elders I ever served with. <laughs> I've often stated most elders never read the Bible. Or, or never mind the incredibly unbelievable, believable, excuse me, misogynistic images of their mother who they constantly show in these cartoons doing nothing but scrubbing floors on her hands and knees, cooking or nodding in agreement with dad, the father, 
on everything he has to say. It's so demeaning, subject for another time. But if you see these, you will see how the governing body has gone to great lengths to instill, instill fear and guilt, its cousin, in children. I'll give you a couple examples. In episode 15, and if you want to go see these, I can't believe it. They're on for the world to see on their website. The parents teach Caleb and Sophia that not listening at meetings, not being in the organization, not being inside their little world, could and will get them killed. I'm not kidding. They flowered up with Pixar-type uh, illustrations and, <laughs> and literally show children that if you leave, you're going to get killed. How do they do this? They go so far in episode 15 as to show Noah and his family drowning. Drowning because they didn't listen to Jehovah and build the ark. And that's what happens when you don't listen at meetings. They literally took that image and showed to Noah, his family. Oh, and they threw in a few animals for good measure. Drowning. They really love that story. It's coming, folks. A whole episode on that. And I just want to say, well, we'll talk about it down the road. Episode 19 sends a not-so-subtle message where Sophia has like a quarter, and she wants to buy a double scoop ice cream with her loose change. But after being guilted and, let's let's face it, with its cousin Fear, by an image of her mom dropping in her money in the contribution box at the Kingdom Hall, Sophia goes out, gives up on that ice cream, and drops her money in the contribution box for the governing body. <laughs> Teaching children at a young age that... You know what's better than double scoop ice cream when you're eight, nine years old? Giving us your money. Because <laughs> we're not going to go into Tony Morris being caught buying baskets full of expensive scotch. We're not going to go into their suits on JW worship episodes. We're not going to go into their jewelry. Needless, they're building a resort complex in upstate New York, but Sophia can't have a double scoop ice cream. <laughs> I laugh, but the first time I saw it, I about put my fist through my computer monitor. Because going beyond just how stupid and absurd it is, some little precious girl in the audience is being taught to give these people her money out of fear. In episode 33, called, might I add, Make Jehovah Happy, there are images of bloody dead guys. I believe it's Cain and Abel, if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember. And there's an entire parade of guilt trips throughout the video, including how evil it is to play video games and gasp, going to school and getting a degree as Sophia stares out the car window at a girl getting her diploma in a poster and decides, oh, that won't make Jehovah happy. It even is complete with images of Jesus and the angels cheering as heaven as Caleb rejects playing a video game, what? And Sophia rejects getting a diploma and still says you can be successful. <laughs> Jesus and the angels start doing the wave. I'm not kidding. Like, a, like the wave in a stadium in the heavens he even shoots a glance back at Jehovah like, look at them too. <laughs> I have to laugh because it's infuriating. And all of this fear centers around leaving the organization, a life outside Jehovah's Witnesses. And I brought it up many times before, and I'm just going to have to do an episode that's probably going to be offensive for anyone who may still believe that this account is real. But they often point to Noah's Ark and compare the organization to Noah's Ark. They love that. Again, they're completely okay with mass genocide including the drowning of babies and puppies. They even made sure to insert it in animation form for Caleb and Sophia to be afraid of if they don't listen at meetings. In episode, uh, what was it, 19, I believe it was? No, th that was episode uh, 15, excuse me, of Caleb and Sophia. They're completely okay with that stuff. In past episodes, we've covered the fireballs of Armageddon, and, and we probably will again, <laughs> But all of this is a message of fear 
whether you're a child, an adult, or anyone who's remotely considering not being part of this organization. It impacts people who start out as outsiders, the fear of missing out, for those that are on the inside, being separated from those you love. On and on it goes. And I could spend another 20, 30 minutes, and we don't have time for that. And frankly, it stops being fun after a while to talk about fear. But it's literally part of a cocktail that the governing body serves up week after week after week. I often think that the governing body is made up of not eight guys in upstate New York, but 10. They have a couple they don't talk about a lot, and you'll appreciate this if you're an old timer. Uh, Brother Fear and Sister Guilty. <laughs> you remember how every talk and every experience they insulted your intelligence with Brother Pioneer or Sister Publisher? <laughs> I use it for fear and guilt. Because in reality, they're a strong, solid, entrenched part of the governing body. So again, why dedicate so much time to this? Because it's so real. It really is real and it's so damaging. But I don't want to end it with that because I want to get into talking about its cousin guilt here for a few minutes. Not as long, let's be honest. <laughs> The Bible itself, their own New World Translation, blows this entire concept of fear out of the water. So if you're a witness listening, someone who's still a believer, someone who still holds the Bible as inspired, whatever the case may be, I respect that. I don't share those beliefs. I'm honest about it, but I respect it. Please take a look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, because it takes everything I've just talked about and flushes it. 1 John 4.18 says, quote, there is no fear in love, but perfect love throws fear outside because fear exercises a restraint. Indeed, he that is under fear has not been made perfect in love, end quote. So if you are still a Christian or believer on the fence, someone who has who decided to leave, I'm so happy to hear that, but are still dealing with the residue or the fear that followed you out the door, please give that verse more consideration. Please also consider therapy. There's a lot of things. But the Bible itself says blatantly that fear and love can't coexist. His book, not mine. <laughs> So everything the governing body does in way of fear, the constant pounding, is nothing more than that. It's a tactic. It's damaging. It should make you angry when you're not actually aching from it. And all of us have been there. All of us have been there. Let's move on for a few minutes. And it probably deserves its own episode, but sometimes I get to the end of these and I just, I'm exhausted because it's just so darn negative unless we have some laughs. But let's talk about guilt, the cousin of fear. This one's more tricky. We often do it to ourselves with lots of conditioning and influence. Let's be honest, we don't choose it. But guilt is all-encompassing. And it's really hard for me to just pick one thing like I did with the many fearful things. We picked one, leaving the organization and what that means and the messaging you receive if you merely think about it. Guilt's a little more difficult. And I'm not going to try to focus in on one thing, but I might give some examples as to what it does and why someone who's thinking of leaving might stay or someone that's left is still dealing with the emotions. Many Jehovah's Witnesses deal with an avalanche of guilt and shame for merely considering that the organization is wrong, much less if they actually decide to leave. So guilt, and I refer to its cousin, shame, are very powerful emotions. And just like the subsequent destructive emotions we have discussed, guilt and shame have been embedded in most Jehovah's Witnesses, usually starting at a young age, as a kid. It is so damaging. If you're hanging on to guilt, just know that you're not alone. I want to validate it, but I want to encourage you to leave it. Guilt leaves people demoralized. More often than not, you'll see someone suffering from depression, anxiety. They feel unworthy of forgiveness. They're anxious all the time. They might even feel dirty. 
they feel completely hopeless. Everything they've known, they've left behind. And so aside from the fear, in comes guilt. And they they do a big three-way hug on you. And those feelings drive people right into negative behaviors, oftentimes alcoholism. That I won't go into to even how many Jehovah's Witnesses decide to take their lives, which is gut-wrenching. I can't go there, at least not tonight. Overeating, sleeping all day, overworking, chasing money, all kinds of problems. And so on the heels of guilt comes the shame. The shame is even more destructive to a human being. It renders them paralyzed with terrible thoughts, feelings, worries, fear. And people feel humiliated, embarrassed, worthless. They start to hate themselves. Thank you, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Because my God, do they know how to teach you guilt. So I want to leave on a couple of examples as we take a look at this fear and guilt and how it traps witnesses. And I want to show you what Jehovah's Witnesses do. I don't want to spend a whole hour doing this. I just want to give you a couple of examples and see if you can pick up on how a witness, particularly a child, but anyone, someone who studies the Bible as an adult with them, begin to be exposed and trained and conditioned to be guilty all the time. I'm going to take a couple of examples. Here's the first one. Perhaps you want to be married and start a family. Seems pretty nice. One of life's greatest experiences, right? Imagine going to the kingdom hall that Sunday and hearing the following. And and not just what I'm about to tell you, but imagine all the comments from the audience as they comment on this paragraph with their answers. This is the Watchtower of 2008, April 15th, page 19. It says, quote, Numerous couples have decided to remain childless, to remain free, to serve Jehovah. Read organization. That's for me. Putting kingdom interests above some of the privileges that go with marriage. Jehovah will not forget their work and the love they show for his name. There will be a great tribulation. It will be a difficult time for us adults and children alike. (laughs) End quote. Now listen. I don't want to plant the seed, but I think you know where I'm going here. It's not a big jump to see that they subtly plant this seed in the minds of people, this guilt for wanting to have a family, for wanting to have a cute little munchkin or two in your life, because, well, the Great Tribulation's coming and it's going to be really hard. In fact, did we mention that people are going to die? They're going to be in bunkers, as we show you in district convention videos, that there's going to be guns and killing, and eh, it might be the kids. You sure you want to have a kid? (laughs) So if you wanted to have kids and start a family, time to feel guilty. It's subtle. It's subtle. And it's there every week for a Jehovah's Witness, so please know that this isn't normal. What you're feeling, what you're hanging on to, what you might be struggling with is very difficult. But I've got to end on one that's a personal favorite. Oh, my God, this one. It, <laughs> on this subject of guilt, I don't want to do, say, take a journey with me like I did last week on this issue of universal sovereignty. But on the subject of guilt, consider this. You're a guy, just a guy, a married guy in the audience. Maybe your wife wife had difficult pregnancies. Maybe she's Maybe you just want to give your wife a gift because she's taking care of birth control, their, your entire relationship. Or, and, and let's just be honest. I've said it on this a million times. Women are so much stronger than men are, in my opinion. They do so much more and take on so much more than we do. If it was up to the human race to be born of a man, it, the human race would be gone. I think we're pansies compared to the strength of a woman. Of, of a woman. Uh, And I think they are the great nurturers and just incredibly loving part of our experience on this earth. But imagine you're a guy on this, in a kingdom hall, it's, it's Thursday night and you're getting hit with this, or let's say it's Sunday because it comes from the watchtower. You're at the watchtower study. You made a decision a few months ago. This one is just a mind blower. And this goes to the guilt that's planted in Jehovah's Witnesses. The Watchtower of June 15th, 1999, pages 27 through 28. And it is one of my all-time personal favorites 
going beyond what is written. And why not? Because you want someone to feel real guilty out there. Quote, since sterilization procedures are now said to be reversible on request, might a Christian view them as an acceptable birth control option? <laughs> I'm sorry. Christians should shape their thinking and deeds by God's esteem for reproductive potential. This would reflect mature sensitivity to scriptural indications. Yet, what if it became publicly known that a Christian blithely disregarded God's evaluations? Would not others doubt whether he uh, or she <laughs> was a good example, having a reputation of making decisions in harmony with the Bible? Such a disturbing blemish on one's reputation could, of course, affect a minister's being qualified for special privileges of service, end quote. In case you didn't pick up on it, this is one example of how the governing body makes people feel guilty. This, folks, is in reference to vasectomies. <laughs> vasectomies, that is correct. This is actually part of what is taught or spoken about when a man could become an elder or a ministerial servant. Aside from the loaded language, it'll take another 30 minutes to even unpack in that paragraph. How incredible would it feel or be to be a man in the audience knowing you had a vasectomy six months ago, and now you are being hit with this? And if you're scrambling for your Bibles to read Jesus' comments on male birth control... <laughs> or what to do with your testicles, let me help you. <laughs> Neither God nor his son commented on vasectomies. However, it's a shining example of how the Watchtower Society will then, and did you catch it, make you feel guilty. You, as a man, for getting a vasectomy could be labeled as someone with a, and I quote, disturbing blemish because you simply decided it was time to stop having more kids or took your wife's health into account or your wife's wishes, which is perfectly fine. If you wanted to stop having kids, time to feel guilty. If you're now going, wait a minute, Stacy, the irony is you just read us one about don't have kids. They could all get killed at Armageddon was insinuated. So if I want to have kids, I'm guilty. Yes. And now you're talking about vasectomies. If I want to stop having kids, I should feel guilty as well? Yes. If you're keeping a scorecard at home, they just want you to feel guilty. <laughs> Almost every decision a person must make in life is examined and held up to scrutiny in Jehovah's Witnesses. If you happen to disagree with the Watchtower Society's opinion on a matter, and almost none of these opinions come from the Bible or can be found in the Bible as admitted in the vasectomy reference, you're left with a feeling that you are, in the very least, a bad example. Cue the guilt. Cue the shame. Cue the fear that you've upset Jehovah. And there you have it. Two examples, and we'll stop there on guilt of how the governing body traps Jehovah's Witnesses in a cocktail of fear and guilt. And those were just a few examples, my friends. I can't solve complex personal emotions for anyone. I've been through them. I'm out the other side. It's been 13 years. But I can share with you what helped me deal with the guilt and the fear when leaving. I have confessed and want to be clear, I'm very agnostic. But in simple terms, when I left, I was honestly still a believer on some level. I was still a believer in an almighty God, in a spiritual construct, in the Bible itself. That has changed a bit. I'm going to be transparent, honest, and respectful on that. Nonetheless, when I left, what helped me deal with guilt and fear and I want to share this with a witness that might be listening now or someone on the fence or someone that's dealing with the pain. 
The first one came from 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. New World Translation, as always, quote, As regard whatever our hearts may condemn us in, because God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. End quote. That's it. What are we worried about that eight guys in upstate New York and their organization don't understand? If you believe in God, he's greater than our hearts. He knows all things. Stop worrying. Stop the fear. Stop the guilt. Seriously. That's not my opinion. That's the great ancient book. His book. The other one I use often, Romans 8, 35 through 39, was a big help to me. I won't read it in the interest of time, but basically nothing, 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 neither death nor life, nor things here, nor things not here, nor things we've never thought of, nor things uninvented. It doesn't matter. Spirits, demons, angels, team Satan, whatever it might be, nothing separates us from God's love. There it is, folks. It's over. Done. That's it. Grow a beard. Have a relationship with someone that is of the same sex, that is a wonderful, loving person. Eat that hamburger. <laughs> Have that glass of wine. Nothing separates us from him. There's no reason to feel fear. There's no reason to feel guilt. It's really that simple. If you're still a believing Bible reader or a Christian or a Jehovah's Witness, a Pini, a Poma, whatever, all those words, and you still believe in Jehovah, not just the eight guys in upstate New York. There it is. That's it. You don't need another scripture. I promise. It's all there. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Please read it. Take time. Even if you're not a believer, that, that scripture is incredibly wise. No God of love wants you to be afraid, to be in fear, to be crushed all the time. It's not even true. And I've got a favorite quote, and this one's going long. I apologize in advance. Uh, it comes from, from a little guy, a little yellow bear, <laughs> that I think is as wise as the scripture I just read. And I'm going to be honest about that. It goes something like this. You're braver than you believe. You're smarter than you seem. And you're stronger than you think. Who pinned those wise words? That was Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Who incidentally and respectfully, I warned everyone I like to have fun. I think is probably about as real as some of the Bible writers. <laughs> so despite the brain numbing message you've been given by Jehovah's Witnesses, that you're completely dependent on a man-made organization for everything, you have the immense power to break free and be a good, loving, successful, happy person without them. Whether you're a religious person or a non-believer, the, re the reality is always the same. We're all designed to be happy in our own skin, to love ourselves. I have yet to meet a person that doesn't want to be happy now, not in the future, not whenever God decides to end his fight with Satan and fireballs rain from the sky. Then we live a thousand years in khakis with fruit baskets and a pet panda. And then he lets Satan out again. What? Subject for another episode. <laughs> We're designed to be happy now. So for those that have asked, that have sent DMs, that have sent me messages, sorry, this was a bit of a rant, but please, and, and for those that are loving Jehovah's Witnesses or those that have left or dealing with the pain of being in a relationship with a witness who's lost everyone, their family, their parents, please be patient. Not only with them, but also with yourself. If you're doubting or leaving, be patient. And for those that are supporting such people, you're amazing. It's a subject for a show where I can share my own experiences. But it can take years to, to wash off that fear, that guilt that's pounded into our brains. And finally, if you're a Jehovah's Witness doubting, if you're afraid, my God, the courage it took to listen to this rant by this crazy podcast host, I can't imagine. Kudos. Or if you're feeling guilty, I'm going to appoint you to some advice that I think is good for everyone, whether you're a believer or a non-believer. In the Bible at Mark 12, 31, it says this. You might recognize it. It's the golden rule. It says, quote, the second is this. You must love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment than these, end quote. 
Who do you love first? You can't love your neighbor. You can't wash away the fear. You can't dump the guilt until you first love yourself. Jesus said it. There's no other commandment. Love your neighbor as first yourself. Sending out big hugs. Thank you so much for all the DMs, all the messages. Please keep them coming. I try to read them all. If I miss it, please, please forgive me. I'm just not good at it. But I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Fear and guilt do not have to be a part of your life. It will not trap you forever. Make the decision. Thanks to all. Be well out there. Another week in the books. Be safe until we meet again. I want to thank you all. Send in a virtual hug. This one was kind of serious, let's be honest. But it comes from the heart. Be well, and I will see you next week.